Hello, everybody. I'm Matt Anderson, and welcome to The Road Not Taken, How Ordinary People Get Out of Their Own Way, and You Can Too. I'd love to uh, introduce our guest today. His name is Bill Cumming. Bill's based in, in Maine on the east coast of the U.S., and uh, Bill's the director of the Boothby Institute. He spent uh, 13 years as an adjunct professor at the University of Maine. He has developed numerous programs on internal motivation and leadership, which have been used by hundreds of school systems, as well as the main state prison system. He has been a coach, consultant and trainer to CEOs varying from Fortune 50 companies to startups to the United States Air Force, the YMCA. And also one of the things you'll want to check out after our uh, podcast today is his TED Talk from 2012, which is called How to Love Even When You Want to Kill. So, so Bill, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, it's a real, it's a real privilege to have you. Um, my first question, and uh, you know, for those familiar with listening, you know, really only pre-prepared question is, you know, for you when it comes to, I guess, getting out of your own way or handling adversity, what, what's kind of, if you had to pick one thing, what have you found most, most important and useful for you? Well, the uh, the first and, and most important thing is at the end of a long string of things, which we'll probably go back to. But for me, it's remembering every day that I live in a miracle. Um, uh, there's a um, um, video on our website called the Blue Dot Video. It's um, Carl Sagan's video that takes about three minutes mm -hmm. and puts the earth in perspective. Um, for example, um, the earth is expanding at somewhere between 100,000 and uh, 2 million miles a second. 2 million miles a second uh, extrapolates out into uh, 7 billion, 200 million miles an hour. Um, if something goes wrong in the universe, um, it isn't going to be a train wreck. It's going to be poof. We're going to be gone. This is the only second I have any guarantee of. So every morning, now I have a very unfair advantage. I have a tidal basin of the North Atlantic in my backyard. Mm -hmm. At high tide, I've got 10 feet of water. At low tide, I've got clam flats. There are a million things, any one of which went wrong. The Earth gets off its axis, and this is no longer predictable 100 years in advance. There's a great deal of effect right at the moment, study on what's going on with uh, the environment and how we're on the brink of destroying it and all of those things. That's because we don't get this as a miracle, right? The moment I look at that tidal basin, I get that I live in a miracle. Second, everything is interconnected. Uh, one of the things that I think is becoming more and more clear is that um, there used to be a great deal of joking done by people, especially in the construction industry, about small creatures being destroyed in their habitat, and nobody worried too much about it, etc. It becomes very clear now that all of the things that are here are here for a reason, either as food for another species or for some other ecological reason. Uh, so first of all, I live in a miracle. Everything is interconnected. There's only one thing I can do anything about. That's how I'm going to be today. Now, that's what I call self-care. Then I read a booklet uh, called Care of the Soul, which I put together um, 15 years ago mm -hmm. and made a deal with all the authors that I could do it. It's abbreviated versions of things that I think are valuable. Um, and um, I read two pages of that. I don't do it because I'm the one who put it together. I do it because every single time I read it, I miss something that was pointed to before. Mm -hmm. So it's useful. It gets my brain going. I recognize I live in a miracle. And here we go. The day is going to turn out the way it does. The only thing I can control is this. And if I get stuck during the day, I don't know anybody who doesn't get stuck. Um, it, it, day in and day out, things cause us to hitch up tragedy, whatever it, it is that happens, just the, even the behavior of other people. The fact of the matter is the moment I recognize that I still live in a miracle, no matter what is going on in those situations or circumstances, I'm far more likely to be constructively engaged in solving the problem as opposed to being stuck in whatever the upset is. So um, if there's one thing that uh, allows me more than anything else is to do that self-care in the morning so I can revisit it at any moment of the day. Mm -hmm. um, it allows me to know, for example, let's assume you came on the, uh, the podcast this morning and you were in a grumpy mood. I can't do anything about that. All I can do is, in my terminology, love you, see whether I can be of use, and we'll either do the interview today or we won't. That's mm -hmm. all there is to it. Anyway, you get the idea. So I get most of it. So certainly starting the day out with a really healthy perspective that, um, yeah, there's a lot to be grateful for and that there's, well, that many things around us are, in fact, miraculous 
is a great way to start. I understand that piece. I understand certainly the value of putting our heads in the right place by reading something that enriches us or empowers us to be a better person or to know more and do better. <clears throat> the, the piece that I want, if you could explain a bit more on, is the interconnected piece. How does that help in terms of dealing with adversity or getting us to take action if we're feeling stuck? Um, primarily because... It, when we're stuck, well, there are a couple of things, two things. Usually when I'm stuck, um, there's something I don't see uh, that's right in front of me that I could do to get the stuckness done. Uh, uh, one of my favorite examples um, comes from the work that we did in the prisons. One of the assignments that we um, do, and you have to understand, when I first started working with the inmates, the prison uh, officials wanted to um, put a guard in the room. And I said, the only way a guard's coming in the room is if the guard's a participant. We're, we're, not, we're not having any observers in here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I ask people to do simple things that they believe uh, are beyond their experience because of the things they've been thinking about and perhaps the way they were trained, et cetera. I ask people to pick uh, the, uh, the chore they hate doing the most um, at home. And uh, these fellows are in the main state prison, and the first thing that happened was this huge guy who I don't think ever missed a physical education opportunity mm -hmm. uh, stood up and said, are you out of your mind, expletive deleted, uh, do you know what we get to do sometimes in here? And I said, well, no, not exactly, but I mean, you can tell me. He said, well, sometimes we get to clean human waste off walls that have been used to communicate. And I said, well, that doesn't sound like much fun, but it's a perfect... Uh, thing to pick. If that should happen this week, this will be a perfect time for you to do this. All I'm asking you to do is do it with energy and enthusiasm and as if it were the most important job in the world. I'm not asking you to like it. Okay, this has nothing to do with liking what you're doing. Now, uh, this particular individual got that opportunity that week and came back to me and he said, and he was very angry the first week. He came back and he said, I would not have believed what happened to me. In the middle of doing this, I, number one, I realized I was getting it done faster. And that clicked for me because I don't like doing it. So I got it done faster. And the second thing he said was, and you could see the emotion in his face, I realized that that's the way I've done every job I ever had. And he means the way he did it before, which was no energy, no enthusiasm. I hate this job. It's a dead end, all of those kinds of things. My experience is, Matt, that the reason people are not doing well at a particular moment is they believe they don't deserve it, mm -hmm. Okay, which goes back to a very basic uh, thing that a great many people are missing. And that is that, number one, their value and worth in the world is a given. Um, this is not a... Um, uh, a notion. This is the absolute truth. Uh, there's a movie called The King's Speech, and the tutor mm -hmm. that was working with the, the uh, king um, got through to him because he treated him like, like a human being, not like the king. He let him know that his affection for him was because he was a human being, not because uh, he was the, the, uh, the king of England. Um, and the the connection that people make, unfortunately, in their early lives is they uh, believe they're either not capable of or not worthy of something. And usually they make that decision along the way someplace. Sometimes it can come from the parents. Sometimes it comes from school. If you ask people who don't like a particular subject what uh, – <laughs> When it was that happened, mm -hmm. they can tell you what grade in school it is, and they usually remember the name of the teacher. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, everything they've ever done is done through the mirror of, I hate math, if that happens to be it. Um, I had a rare privilege because of my mentor, Albert Boothby, uh, to spend uh, six weeks in an all-black independent school in Sedalia, North Carolina in 1964. And when these kids found out what I knew about math, my father was a self-taught math genius, um, I spent most of my afternoons tutoring these kids. Now, in 1964, uh, the notion was that people of color were not as intelligent as white people. Mm -hmm. And not only white people believe that, but people of color believe that. So at the beginning of the summer, we did an IQ test and it was run through Princeton. The, I, I don't remember what the name of it was, but it, that's where all tests were run in, in those days. And, um, and then we did an IQ test at the end of the summer. Well, it was called the college board. The college board went nuts because the IQ scores went up 17 points. And they said, that can't happen. Just can't happen. Mm -hmm. um, 
what we realized was that these youngsters, when they came that first day and took that IQ test, were taking it through the filter of everything they'd been told. First of all, here are some white people, mm -hmm. mostly white people, giving them a test. Right. Uh, and so why should they get, pay any attention to that? Uh, and they did it sort of believing that they weren't going to be very good at it, and the results were what they were. Mm -hmm. During the six weeks, what was communicated to them was not enough facts to alter an IQ score. However, what did happen was they began to realize they could achieve a great deal because they had a whole bunch of people who not only believed in them but demonstrated to them they had the capacity. So the second test they took was dramatically different – with a dramatically different attitude. Consequently, the scores went up and the college board realized we didn't make a mistake. That actually happens. If I take a test half-assed, even if it's an IQ test, we're going to get inappropriate results. The the place I'm trying to get to here in this conversation is if you believe you're not worthy mm -hmm. or you're not capable, that's the way you approach everything. So my experience is that what people need to recognize is that their value and worth in the world is a given. It doesn't make any difference how they came to think that they, that wasn't true, but it is. Um, and the other thing is the only reason a person denigrates another human being, puts a person down, um, is because they actually don't value themselves. Um, if I'm working with you and you don't have a particular skill, we approach what we can do to see how we can improve that, all of those kinds of things. The moment I judge and evaluate you uh, in any kind of way, um, by demeaning you, uh, consulting, insulting your intelligence or anything like that, that's about what's going on with me. It's not about what the person themselves is doing. So um, we have to look at the fact that, for example, right now we're in a situation where because of the outrageous behavior of some people, mm -hmm. others are responding in exactly the same way, denigrating each other, all of those kinds of things. Sorry, folks, that's about the unwellness of everybody involved. Mm -hmm. If I put you as a human being down, that means that I don't value me. Because if I'm really awake to this, I know that the capacity for everything resides within you, which is what I learned in 1979, which goes back to the origins of my work. Because mm -hmm. nothing I had done up until 1979 opened my eyes to what the real capacity was in human beings. And I do want to go back to that too, to, to 1979, but, but you've brought up so many profound points that I just don't want to let some of any of them slip but in terms of helping people feel more worthy because it sounds like that's the key to giving people enough faith in themselves to take the actions that will get them to you know becoming the person they most want to be where do you start well the, the, unfortunately uh contrary to some popular opinion you don't start by saying I want to love me, I want to improve my value, and if I say enough times in front of the mirror, I'm a valuable person, all those things, um, it does not, generally speaking, produce the result. Um, it, we, in, in the work that I do, we work with p case studies. People pick other people that they know uh, who aren't doing well or struggling, whatever, that they work with. The first thing that has to be communicated is that that person is loved. Now. Uh, love is a charged word in our society. I want to define it for a moment. If I brought you a 10-year-old child from a third world country, would you want that child to starve to death? No. Would you want them to be homeless? No. You'd want them to be able to lead a meaningful, productive, contributory, joyous life. Mm -hmm. Yes? And have the tools necessary to do so. Mm -hmm. That's what I call loving people. Ultimate high regard. Wanting well for. You can tell when people actually have your best interests at heart. So the best thing to do is seek out somebody who believes in you, all right, and talk through that whole process of your value and worth. The second thing is that um, people have to recognize that the capacity for everything is inside of all of us. Um, we, uh, I used to believe, for example, that there were good and bad people. I know for sure that there's the capacity for good and bad in every person, and I mean every possible evil thing you could do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but notice the the word evil is not used in relationship to people; it's used in terms of behavior. If I do damage to you and it's significant enough damage, it's a horrendous situation. But we've got a confusion going on in the world because uh, people get into this righteous thing of judging and evaluating what other people do and all those kinds of things. The only way a person comes, overcomes that 
experience that they're not worthy is through another ex- experience with another human being who knows that they are worthy. Mm-hmm. So, and then, then they also have to, in order to cement it in place, they have to start achieving things uh, that uh, they recognize they produce that result. It was not a luck or a fluke or anything else that they produce that result. Uh, one of the things that came out as a result of the first phase of our work with the military is that um, in, when in a National Guard environment, some people are not there for anything but the, the fact that they, you know, the convenience of it and they make some money and they get college credits. The ultimate goal, though, of the people who run that is for people to discover their capacity. Well, if somebody's doing a job that Everyone knows they can do, but they're not doing it. We use terms like lazy, doesn't care, all those kinds of things. What they're actually trying to do is prove they don't have any value. Mm -hmm. So what you have to tell them is, look, you have a choice about this. This is something you can decide to put that energy we just described into it and see what the result turns out to be, or you can continue the same pattern. The minute they have an experience that they can do things differently and that their value and worth in the world is not dependent on the results, it's a given, then all of a sudden the way you approach everything changes. Your ego is not in it in the same way. Um, and once people begin to get some traction on that, they choose to do that on a regular basis because it feels good. I want to get things accomplished, so I'm going to do those kinds of things. Um, it all comes down to the way I feel about myself, and unfortunately, you cannot give that to somebody intellectually. I have asked 20,000 people mm-hmm. easily. Um, if you are a person who believed you didn't have any value in the world and you now recognize you have value, what were the ingredients that were present at the time that transfer took place? And to a person with one exception, they say there was somebody there who cared about me and showed me some things that I could do and I began to realize I could experience it, etc. The one person who said that's not how I got it said I got it from a book and there are wonderful books to read. I said, okay, great. Where'd you get the book? My friend friend gave it to me okay uh, my, my experience is it is another human being reaching out and caring for another person in a genuine kind of way about the capacities that exist inside of them all of our work though it has lots of different facets is based on two simple things one you are loved and valued and your value is an absolute given and you have a choice there is always a choice about how i approach things that doesn't mean it's easy um Viktor Frankl, a uh, mm-hmm. psychiatrist um, who was interred in Auschwitz, wrote a line, the last of the freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. That's after his family had been gassed in Auschwitz. Mm-hmm. And when people hear that, they say, well, that's just because he's a special guy. Mm-hmm. Uh-uh. No. That capacity is in you. All right. That I can't imagine how horrendous that was for him, mm-hmm. but he realized they're all dead. Now, my only choice is I can either be of use to my fellow prisoners and not denigrate the guards. After Auschwitz was liberated by the Allied forces, the story is that the German guards got a message to Viktor Frankl to thank him for not hating them. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> that's because Frankel was able to isolate those kind of things. The warden at the main state prison, when we finished the work, he said, I want to ask you a question. He said, why are these inmates that you've been working with no longer baitable? All right. Our guards are saying they're not rising to the occasion. They're just doing their work, this, that, and the other thing. Mm-hmm. I said, they finally figured out that you and the people with the keys are in charge of whether they get visitations and whether they get phone calls and all the other privileges and everything else. They're no longer at the effect of you. They're doing what they're doing now because they choose to do it, not because you've got the keys and they're in prison. They think it's worthwhile. Mm-hmm. So anyway, you get the idea. So you're saying then that, that it's funny, actually, because I, I just got to bring up the Viktor Frankl thing, because I remember many years ago, I saw Stephen Covey speak, mm-hmm. and I felt compelled to get up and ask him a question about Viktor Frankl, because I felt like I just could not relate to his story. And I remember saying to, to Stephen Covey, I said, you know, I, I mean, I haven't experienced anything remotely like what he did. And so to talk about you know, choosing an attitude in that situation, it's almost like I, because I can't relate to such an extreme, it, I couldn't apply it to my own life. It seemed too right. too far flung. Are you saying then that it that the place to start for all of us is to to take more or to be more, well, as you said, en- put more energy and enthusiasm into even the tasks we typically don't like doing 
because how we do one thing is how we do everything. Is that sort of what you're saying? If if you yes, that, that's basically it. I want to go back though to the thing about I can't relate to Viktor Frankl because of the massive nature of the tragedy. Yeah. So how can I relate to that? But the only reason we're having a conversation with somebody who's stuck in business or can't see something for themselves mm -hmm. is because some piece of them is stuck in exactly the same way that Viktor Frankl could have been stuck. Nine t people out of ten would probably have been devastated, um, not done anything to be of use to the rest of the prisoners. Hang on. <coughs> Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Would not have been able to uh, do anything but deal with their own grief. This is something that grows upon experience, and the only place you can start is your own experience. The first thing I ask people it, when they're struggling mm -hmm. is a question that has nothing to do with the current circumstances. My question is, if wishes were horses and beggars could ride, what would you do? Okay, if you could do anything just because of a whim, not mm -hmm. having to do with money or circumstances or anything else, what would you do? Um, and the answer comes usually relatively quickly. If it, there were no uh, obstacles in the way, sure. there's usually something that people want to do. I said, how much time did you spend working on that today? And usually the answer is none. I don't have time. I have my family. I have my job. I have all my other commitments. Huh. If I want to do something, uh, I have to begin playing in that arena. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I stupidly, when I started out, my, my goal is to end all violence because I, I know that all violence, the root of all violence is the unwellness of human beings. Mm -hmm. um, and if we could get to a place where we could identify it, um, and we've got a couple of very good examples right at the moment. Um, our president demonstrates behavior that is profoundly unwell. Mm -hmm. Okay, You do not denigrate women in that way unless you have been personally damaged. Mm -hmm. That doesn't come of a, as a natural thing. So my feeling toward him is one of sending loving kindness, and I'd actually give my right arm to talk with him. Because mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is somewhere along the line, he believed, he, he developed a feeling that if I just bluster through my way through, don't give a damn about anything else, I can get some results. Well, guess what? He got some results. He's mm -hmm. president of the United States. Yeah. And what is equally disturbing to me is the opposition who's doing exactly the same thing in relation to him. Mm -hmm. Okay, I may not like certain behaviors, but my job is not to become adversarial toward him as a human being. We've got people confused with their behavior. Um, if you want to see a spectacular demonstration of um, some people who have figured it out, the prisons in Norway mm -hmm. recognize the only way somebody gets well is for them to experience their value and worth in the world. They only allow 21 years in prison, no matter what the crime is. Uh, and if you talk to the people that um, – Michael Moore, who I'm not always wild about because mm -hmm. he allows himself to get seduced into the make wrong and the bombast and all that stuff, did a movie in um, uh, a few years ago, I don't know how long, four or five years ago, called Where to Invade Next, which has nothing to do with military things. Okay. Have you seen it by any chance, Matt? No, I've seen quite it's, a bit of his stuff, but not that one. This well, I, I never knew it existed. I'd mm -hmm. seen some of the others and didn't get very far through some of them because I don't like the denigration of people. Mm -hmm. But this, it's like Michael took a loving kindness pill and then did this movie. This is about 12 programs all over the world that work brilliantly. Mm -hmm. And they are all grounded in exactly the same thing. Dignity, grace, loving kindness, ownership, and responsibility. Anyway, um, the, these, the prison in Norway is about people coming to know their value and worth in the world. We have a correctional program. You cannot correct people into wellness, let alone some of the other issues about why the d disparity between the number of people of color in prison right. and everything else. There are some big problems we need to clean up as our society, but that's a whole other conversation. The, you asked about Viktor Frankl and it being outside their experience. You have to find a way for an individual to experience that they can bring a different attitude to things in order for this thing that we're talking about to work. It c cannot be gotten intellectually. You can have a thought about it till hell won't freeze over. The minute I know I can clean feces off a wall with energy, enthusiasm, and as if it were the most important job in the world, there is no other job probably for me mm -hmm. that I would think is more gross than doing something like that. Um, the fact of the matter is for every person, they have to have a personal experience in relationship with it and ideally with another human being who has an experience that their value is a given. Are there other things that people can do? Or I mean, it, it, so first I get one question time. So is it is it the repetition of tasks 
that we typically don't like and and shifting that mindset towards them that then you're saying has these positive knock-on effects to internalizing ourselves as more worthy is that what you're saying well it's actually uh, it's it, the reason it works is because of their experience. Now, um, unfortunately, uh, writing books about this uh, is not likely to produce the result mm-hmm. other than in people picking up habits that are more likely to lead to success. The biggest issue, quite frankly, Matt, is that many, many people believe they have no value. Now, there are lots of ways to get that. Um, it can happen because of childhood experiences. I grew up in a home, God rest my parents' soul, where I – and I this uh, middle-class home to be sure, there was no effort and struggle about food or any of those kinds of things. Uh, I grew up in a home where by the time I was 10 years old, I believed I would never get anything right. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would cut the grass. My, we, my parents rented a house up in Amenia, New York, and uh, this thing had about an acre of grass. It took – I had a single engine, Briggs and Stratton, push, you know, mower type thing. And uh, it took about five hours to cut that grass. Not once do I remember my father coming home and and not saying, Bill, don't you see that tuft of grass out there over the, you know. And I, would, I, I knew it was there. Mm-hmm. There was no question about that. I'd just go get the lawnmower and cut it because I knew what needed to be done. But what I did was internalize that mm-hmm. to think – well, I'm, I'll never get anything. I won't ever get it right. Mm-hmm. Um, I, one thing that, that contributed to it, my brother's incredibly bright, went to first in his class in high school, I think first in his class at University of Michigan, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't compete with it kind of situation. But when I met Albert Boothby, he said to me basically, look, Bill, you can either complain about feeling like you can't get anything right, or you can start engaging and working on things that you think are worthwhile. And for me, when I found out in 1961 that all the schools in the United States were segregated, I went, hey, wait a minute. This is not okay with me. Mm -hmm. And I actually hadn't opened my mouth in public school for a long time due to a situation in a classroom. Uh, I started talking when I was in the ninth grade, and I have yet to shut up. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, Okay, so it's, it's also about doing things that we believe are worthwhile um, and also, it's interesting. So you you say that the only trigger to turn people's lives around is when somebody else believes in them. I mean, surely one of the things I've learned doing these interviews, and maybe I've always thought this, maybe more subconsciously, but I think just about everyone on the planet has this sort of layer within them where they know that they're capable of more, and it probably lies dormant or it gets quickly talked down. But I mean, everybody, almost everybody starts a new year with optimism that they can make big changes. So why does it always need to come from somebody else believing in them? I mean, it, or, 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 and or are there other ways that people can, I don't know, have a spark of initiative or something that gets them moving in the right direction? Matt, I would love to answer your question that there is another way. But if if, 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 if we find that there is another way to do this, that's what I'll be doing. Okay. Uh, and... This is not about uh, some massive intervention. This is about a human being operating with another person in a way that they walk away from the experience knowing that there's nothing they can do to – that that because you make a mistake, um, it it does not mean you're a bad person or anything like that. Mistakes – uh, things that don't work are nothing more than an opportunity to realize how I can do things differently and learn from them. Um, I, I wish we had an opportunity to use graphics, but I'll see whether I can describe it adequately. Um, if you believe you don't have any value, and that could come from uh, if the first thing you heard was, I wish the little SOB had never been born, mm-hmm. or you get abused or damaged or whatever it turns out to be, uh, you have a whole bunch of negative experiences that on the inside of yourself that are created by that. So when you have a negative experience, it fits your picture of your value and worth. It just goes in. Now, when a person who believes they have no value has a positive experience, what do they think that is? They write it off, chance. They write it, it's an accident, it's a fluke. Mm -hmm. If someone points out to them that if they can achieve in this area and discuss with them what attitude they brought to it, how they approached things, etc., then all of a sudden I can realize if I can do that in this, I can do that in other places in my life. Okay. So, sorry to interrupt you, but no, I just, no, that's all right. it's, it's something that's much on my mind, and I could see, again, forgetting this completely. So 
help me connect the dots here. You you asked me before the call to do something that was mundane and that I couldn't stand doing. Mm-hmm. And so I did that. And I, I, I guess I've, I've got to finish my thought here. So basically I did it and, um, and I did, it was a more, much more, it was a more positive experience. I was certainly felt a lot lighter about doing it. I had a better attitude about it. Um, it didn't feel so burdensome. Um, and so I was definitely pleased that you assigned it. However, it's still top of my list to outsource to somebody else to do because it's definitely not one of my strengths and because it sucks up actually it's mostly around time but also it's not something i'm particularly good at either and so the the, where i'm going with this is it's you know in other words are you saying the starting point um is with the tasks that we don't like to do but but you know whenever i listen to people that are infinitely more accomplished than i am they don't spend their time on on things they don't like to do or their weaknesses. So kind of talk about the connect, how those dots connect. Okay. First of all, absolutely nothing wrong with you outsourcing the editing. Okay. The fact of the matter is that um, you now recognize that the attitude you brought to it changed the, re- the result. I imagined it, ha- it got done quicker and you felt yes, better about it. Absolutely. All of that stuff. Yep. Great. Well, that's applicable in any circumstance. Obviously, though, Given what you want to do and your ultimate goal, you don't want to spend your time editing, so hiring somebody is a really good idea. This is not about cleaning toilets for the rest of your life Mm -hmm. because you've discovered you can do it with energy, enthusiasm, and as if it were the most important job in the world. However, if I'm the CEO of a company, I damn well better not ask my employees to clean the toilet with energy, enthusiasm, and as if it were the most important job unless I'm willing to do the same thing. I don't want the CEO in the room doing it, but I want to damn well make sure they know they can do it and they know what they're asking other people to do. Um, it, anyway, the, the reinforcement of it is simply a matter of if you can recognize you can produce that result, you can do that in other arenas. It's not about staying and continuing to do things just so that you can prove, well, I cleaned the toilet with energy and enthusiasm. That's not it. And, by the way, it's not about painting it on. Uh, Norman Vincent Peale was a great guy, but this is not about just painting out a, ha- a, a smile and everything will be okay because uh, that's not the way it works. Um, anyway. Okay, so oh, another thing I want to ask you about is self-talk. So, because you talk about um, some, I forget why, why, why exactly why I wrote it down, but I mean I, that seems to be the thing that will again talk us out of things. So you know whether you say if, if you if you grow up feeling relatively worthless, even when you have a good experience and you, you tend to write it off, but it's it's the ongoing you know week after week. How do you expel that sort of years of? growing up in a negative environment that led you to feeling, I mean, again, I'm overstating it for some people, but, but, but e- either way that their worthiness doesn't help them think that they can achieve significantly more in any area that's really important to them. Can you talk about self-talk and, uh, sure. yeah. where, uh, that, where uh, that ties in? Self-talk is fine, but, um, just point of reference, if this could be transmitted, uh, in writing, I would have already done it in such a way that uh, as best I can. As a matter of fact, th- there is a book that's about all of what we're talking about inside the Be a World That Works for Everyone website, and you'll have that later. But that book that I <laughs> that I haven't published because I don't think it's the answer, self-talk is not it. Our work is I won't work with people for less than 12 weeks because what I do is take one experience and then ask them to experiment with it next week with a different slice of the same thing. Okay. Once you get the the realization um, that the attitude you bring to things markedly changes them and you know that somebody has the experience that you are powerful and capable, I've never dismissed a client. And the reason I haven't dismissed it, one, is because I'd, I've never experienced one who I didn't believe was powerful and capable. Um, and people can sense when they're genuinely being spoken to out of somebody's experience, or I'm saying that because that's what one says to people who are stuck. Okay, There's a difference. I don't think you can do it. I know you can do it. Mm-hmm. Um, there are very few people who ha- do not have the ability to take – their current circumstance and through a series of uh, internal exercises find out that they can do things in a very different way and that are much more likely to produce the result. But there's another piece we haven't talked about, 
And that is, if I have the experience that I'm not worthy, then I do everything in the context of I'm not worthy. Let me uh, give you one of my favorite examples. Uh, Lynn Plord is a children's author who lives here in Maine. And she and her fiancé were going to have a uh, celebration. Just they wanted to have a dinner, and Lynn was making homemade food and everything. In any case, um, the assignment was to pick an event and uh, pick an attitude and then do the event. Well, what they decided was to pick magic, and Lynn made homemade pasta, homemade marinara sauce, bread. Everything was homemade. Paul got there, um, her now husband of 30-some-odd years, um, but Paul got there at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, about a minute after that, a huge tree next to his car came down, crushed his car. He would have been killed if he were still in it, and de- separated the power cable or the, the power lines from the house. So that was the end of supper. Okay. The power company and the police department said, you got to leave the cars, the, everything, just get out of the house. They m- made it possible for them to get out of the house. We don't know when this is going to be shut down. You need to go someplace. They walked across the bridge a mile to the new McDonald's that had been just built. They're not, then they were not fans. But they walked across the bridge, had dinner, and walked back. And they created a magical meal so powerful that at any point in their relationship – they need to focus something serious or potentially tragic or whatever. They look at each other and say, let's create some magic. And they know what to do. It has nothing to do with the circumstance. It has to do with the attitude you bring to it. Now, um, if I know that I can do that, then I recognize that I can do that in any kind of circumstance. It's not about painting something on over the top of it. It's recognizing Paul wasn't killed. The power didn't uh, electrocute uh, Lynn. Uh, all kinds of things didn't happen. And if something had happened, you take care of whatever part of the tragedy it is and recognize if I'm still breathing, then I have two things. I can either point to that as my reason for not um, wanting my life to work out and stay in that negative self-talk. Negative self-talk is like every single thing you have ever heard that people have said to you that was negative uh, gets stored in your head. Um, uh, Again, I'll go back to the example with my dad because it's the clearest one. One day I came home after he had come to live with us, and that's a whole other story about my brother and my mom and all that stuff. But dad came to live with us, and I came home at about 8 o'clock. I'd been teaching at a sc- up in a school someplace in Maine, and uh, I walked in, and my father was lecturing my children about how far apart the forks, knives, and spoons needed to be in the silverware drawer. And I said, Dad, can I talk to you for a minute? took him in the dining room and I said, Dad, I don't want you telling the children how far apart the forks, knives, and spoons need to be in the silverware drawer. And he said, why not? That's the way it should be. I said, Dad, that's the way it was when I grew up. And that's what I did, exactly that. But I don't want you telling the children to do that. He said, well, I don't know whether I can stand that. I I may need to move out. I said, well, you may choose to do that, but I don't want you to do it. And I'll tell you why. He said, okay, why? Um, He said, uh, I said, uh, did you get your appetizers exactly at 530 and the way you like them? Yes, uh, better than yours. I said, great, I got it, good. Uh, What about um, dinner? At at 6 o'clock, you got your dinner, and they prepared it and cleaned up and everything and tasted okay? Yes, it was wonderful. I said, great. Have you thanked them for that? No. That's why I don't want you telling them about the silverware drawer because the only thing they're going to remember from tonight's dinner is you didn't. they didn't do it well enough because they forgot to put the silverware back in exactly the way you think it ought to be. So I'm not sure I'm ready for this. I said, great. So he moved out for two months, and then he called me two months later, and he said, okay, I'm ready to be grandpa, and I'll forget the silverware drawer. And from that point on, he had 15 wonderful years with my children and before he died, and I were able to keep him home until two days before he died. His entire, his entire life was different after that moment because he realized that he, even though he was a highly successful individual, had brought a negative only look at the what's not right, what's not good, what's not done attitude most of his life. Pretty interesting. I'm I'm amazed that he was able to change because I, I must admit I've typically had this attitude that most people. I should say my attitude is oh no, my attitude my experience has been that most people don't change. I guess I'm not saying most people can't change, but that they tend not. They generally don't, and that they it's unrealistic don't. to expect people to change. I always have always thought. Well, I, I don't have any expectation that they will or they won't. I focus on the fact that I know they can. 
Hmm. And I say that to them. And I said, look, this is a choice you're going to have to make. And not only are you going to have to make it now, you'll probably have to make it a hundred times before it becomes uh, internalized within you. I'll give you the other piece of the story because uh, it'll make more sense. My mother and father, um, uh, my mother's story was, if only I hadn't married Harold. And they, it was a war zone. Hmm. I was able to get out of the house permanently when I was 12 years old, and I was thrilled to do it. Now, Again, there's so many other stories, but I was not in the house. And when I got a chance to go to Palmer Memorial Institute as a senior to an all-black prep school in Sedalia, North Carolina in 1964, I said, yes. Why they let me go, I have no idea. Okay, but they let me go. Um, it, make a long story short, I took care of my dad, as I told you. And on the day my dad died, um, I knew it was me that needed to call mom to let her know that he'd passed. So I called her and I said, I just wanted to know, let you know that dad passed. And she said, yeah, I'm sure you'll miss him. They both had a way to just stuck the old knife in. Uh, I let go of it. I, by that time, I didn't bother. She was 83 years old at that age uh, and very negative. She never found a circumstance she couldn't complain about. They were well suited to each other. Um, my brother bought my mother a beautiful condominium on the second floor of this apartment building overlooking Reeds Lake in Grand Rapids, Michigan. She complained about the fact that she was on the second floor and it had three bedrooms, much too much to clean. If it had been on the first floor with two bedrooms, she'd have complained that the view was better on the second floor and I need more space to store my crap. Okay, She mm -hmm. wouldn't have ever used the word crap. But anyway, um, th the negativity was overwhelming. I'm an intuitive caller. So after this call about my father's death, I called my mother to say, Mom, how you doing? She said, I'm not doing very well. I said, why? I waited 10 days too long to say some pretty important things. Mm -hmm. I said, like what? She said, I actually think I loved your father. Hmm. And I said, well, um, you remember when he drove out seven or eight years ago and knocked on your door and you wouldn't let him in? Yep. I said, the reason he was there was because he wanted to let you know he thought you were a terrific person. He loved you with all his heart and he was really sorry that it, it, he had allowed it to let, turn out this crappy. Well, my mother was not a demonstrative person, and you could tell that uh, th that really got to her, and she was crying. I said, Mom, you don't need to work, worry about Dad. Mm -hmm. He's okay. He, he was ready to go. He was in a lot of pain when he died. It's okay. I said, you need to look about the rest of the other people. I said, and I don't mean me. We're at peace. When I went to North Carolina to help Albert Boothby found Upward Bound um, – and my mother said, if you go, you become the end lover in the family. Don't come back. I didn't go back for more than two days a year for many, many years. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is, I, she said, I know who you're talking about. You're talking about your brother and sister-in-law. I said, well, what kind of attitude do you have? And do they know the incredible um, uh, contribution they've been to your life? Because you tell me about it, but have you told them? She said, I know what you're talking about. I'll think about it. Three days later, my sister-in-law calls me and says, what did you do to mother? And I said, I didn't do anything to mother. She said, well, uh, I don't understand what's happening, but mother just spent the entire weekend apologizing for having been a B-I-T-C-H her entire life. Mm -hmm. From that day in 19, or eight, excuse me, 1983 until she died, uh, excuse me, 93, until she died in 2000, she never had another negative word to say. And that, sorry, that came from you pointing out that she should be more grateful or she thanked no, that came because she realized that she had waited until my father died to say some pretty important things, okay? And that, would, or that was already gone by, so she, there was nothing she could do about that. But she knew there was the same situation. When my mother got into Mary Abbott's car, all she ever talked about was the dog hair, the cat hair, your children are too noisy, and right. you love your mother more than me. Well, she knew that was wrong, especially in the relationship to what she just discovered with my father. Mm -hmm. So she looked and she went back and she acknowledged them. Um, there was an incident when she finally had to go to a nursing home where a woman with Alzheimer's came through her room like a hurricane. Just, just if that had happened before my mother woke up, mm -hmm. she would have been so upset. She'd have been upset for a week. No question about it. She looked at me and she said, Bill, it'll be okay. I'll clean it up later. I got plenty of time. Mm -hmm. I about fell on the floor. That's amazing. Once somebody, one, once somebody internalizes this, Matt, it's not permanent. That's why the self-care is so important. If I don't recognize that this second is the only one I've got any guarantee of, how do I want to be? How do I want to treat you? How do I want to deal with whatever comes up today? We, we're constantly thinking about what's going to happen next week. If I focus on this second and it's the only one I've got, do I want to be uh, 
angry and hostile and negative and all that stuff with you? Or do I want to see whether I can be useful and constructive and productive? It's always about choosing. Um, Choice and choice and choice. There's no place to get to. My experience is uh, every once in a while I hear people talking about, well, yeah, I went through this and and I never have any negative moments anymore. Horse hockey. Mm -hmm. I don't buy that for a second. Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody who doesn't get stuck. I've been in a room with Thich Nhat Hanh when he was furious, okay? And I was in a a friend of mine is a Buddhist monk. Just ripped, excuse me, very upset in the San Francisco airport. I told the monk to go sit down. He was mm-hmm. the problem. Huh. Um, anyway, the, this is not about like there's some place to get to. But if you get to the place where you see this is the only second you can make any choice about, you can then rechoose it. It's just a matter of common sense. It's not some magical transformation. And there's another problem that contributes to the issue. We have people now talking about the, as if we had the ability to teach, empower, motivate any of those things, other human beings. If I can do that for you, Matt, that who does that make responsible for what you're now doing? Right, you. Yeah, and right. that's horse hockey. Right. That's not true. All I do get to do is create an environment where you know I have the experience that you can do this, and you test it out. It's not about some kind of magical thing I give you. I don't believe that's true. What I do believe, though, is that people consistently see where the choices are. They begin to see that they'd rather be making the choices that work for them as staying in the same negative pattern. Uh, It's not about you continuing to do the editing forever. It's a matter of recognizing that that attitude applies to anything you do. That's interesting. So are you saying then that it's breaking down our time so that bit by bit by bit we're making more conscious positive choices and building on that momentum so that we can build feelings of greater worth and therefore presumably more confidence to know that we can go out and make more positive changes yes so it's not it's it's less about the epiphany you know that you know where we think we've sort of changed our entire lives because we've had a certain realization is that is that or is i mean that's exact no couldn't have been described better perfect um it, there might be a, a a high that comes people go away for a seminar and they get a high and whatever um but almost immediately it goes back because they get back in the same pattern they don't recognize that the issue is the choice that's right in front of them this moment um it isn't an immediate moving from I don't matter to I do matter. It's over time I begin to realize that I do matter. Let me give you one other quick um, example. Albert Boothby um, gave me a tremendous amount of responsibility early in my life, changed my entire life the way I was able to do things. Um, I, by the time we were in our second year, I was hiring my univer- Kenyan College faculty to come down and work with us. I also hired my girlfriend, and he said, that's fine as long as she's talented enough and no, no hanky-panky. One night in the middle of the summer, n- no in flagrante delecto, uh, she, we fall asleep in his office, which I had, I had keys to everything. I ran the do- dormitories, the kitchen, anything non-academic, I ran. 5.30 in the morning, Albert Boothby, who talked with a list, came into the room and said, very interesting, William, very interesting. Jeannie, go back to your dormitory. He said to me, Bill, I love you. You know I've given you a tremendous amount of responsibility. You need to know I'm always going to be interested in talking with you, caring about you, etc. You don't have the option of doing this again. This was your one mistake. Okay, You need to understand I can't have any kind of things like this happening. But remember, I love you and go get a shower because you need to start the day. I was walking between the, his office and the boys' dormitory and mm-hmm. I burst into tears. Because I realized what it felt like to have somebody love you no matter what. Hmm. Now, uh, my parents and I were able to get to that place, but when they were in their 80s and 90s, okay, I was 19 years old when that incident took place. And it altered my life because I recognized that this man, no matter what, number one, it was very clear to me that he thought well of me, Mm -hmm. but he also was not going to have me screwing, screwing up. And he'd always be interested, but I wouldn't be working with him because <laughs> he wasn't about yeah, – anyway, go well, ahead. It's funny because one of the things I wanted to ask you about from your TED talk was where you talk about the importance – or you said the greatest difference is when people internalize love unconditionally. Um, mm-hmm. And I couldn't help but think, unfortunately, gosh, you know, most of us aren't raised – with unconditionally loving parents. I mean, most of us are raised by flawed people, and because I'm, I'm a flawed parent myself. So – I mean, and on one level, that sounds like almost too tall of an order to ask people. If 
if we continue to have this conversation and we interject it over a 12-week period of time, it may be that that would be enough. I don't know. Um, we have another part of – it's another 12 weeks. But after the 24 weeks is over, uh, I tell people they have lifetime access to me for no other charge mm -hmm. Okay, because I figure I'm done. I've, I've said all, I, all the cleverness is done. Um, and – the fact is not everybody continues to do what they discovered during that period of time. Sure. But I will tell you that 99% of the people who come back and say, Bill, this is working tremendously for four or five years or whatever. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden, everything's falling apart again. I said, you doing self-care on a daily basis? No. I said, okay, you got to go back and do the self-care. This is a miracle. It's still a miracle. I don't, you know, we haven't screwed it up yet. So all I get to do is choose how I'm going to be in this second. And the moment I remember, that's about discipline. And if I do it today, I can do it tomorrow. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi is one of my big uh, – I'm a big fan of Mahatma Gandhi mm -hmm. because I'm interested in peace. But more importantly for this quote, is it any wonder there is so much untruth being delivered to a bewildered world with everyone claiming the right of conscience, like telling you how to run your life, what to do, all those things, without going through any discipline whatsoever themselves? <laughs> we got everybody telling everybody how to run their life without going through discipline. Gandhi used to say, when I know I've got a bad day coming or a, a day with, you know, maybe he was meeting, meeting with the British Parliament, I don't know, he would say, I have to double my self-care. So he'd take two hours of the self-care. Mm -hmm. My self-care runs anywhere from uh, 15 minutes to an hour, and I vary it depending on what I know I need to do. And what are some things that you recommend to others in terms of good self-care? And, and also, is this typically something you do first thing in the morning as well? It is, it is something I do first thing in the morning because from my experience and the people I've worked with, when you start your day with the clarity that this second is a miracle uh, and I get to choose how I'm going to be, um, it, everything is clearer. So, again, I find a way. And if, if I'm not at the ocean, I have a angel wing begonia behind me. It's huge. Uh, it's, it, at full length, it's eight feet wide and eight feet high. It's, and it has cluster, pink clustered flowers on it when it's blooming. Um, it's hard to miss miracle if I look at that plant. Anything I look at in the physical world is likely to produce that result. Um, observing your children um, recognizing just taking your fingers and touching the tips of your fingers with the the tip of your thumb, recognizing the sensitivities that's in there and the hundreds of thousands of connections that have to be present in order to have feeling in my hand. I was hit by a car as a pedestrian in 1972. I have two titanium knees and two titanium hips. Oh. The fact of the matter is if I focus on all of that stuff, I can depress myself in the next week. Y yeah, does it get – Painful, awkward, tired sometimes? Absolutely. So what? The question is, so I live in a miracle. Everything's interconnected. The only thing I control is how I'm going to be today. And then I read two pages of Care of the Soul. Now, it's right here. This is, the, this is not even the newest one, mm -hmm. but I print them out, and I read two pages of it because each time I read it, I still get something new. If it stops, I take people out. Uh, I change the authors. I also have another book that sits right here. It's called – it's James Natchway's Inferno. Do you know who Natchway is? I've never heard of him. He's a photographer. He's one of the original Magnum 7 photographers. You know the picture of the um, uh, World Trade Center with after the – the uh, explosions with uh, the, f the firemen holding the flag up against – you can see the superstructure in the background, and the firemen are holding that flag. It's a, it was on time and mm -hmm. all that. He's, he's Time Magazine special photographer. He used to be a war photographer. This book is called The Inferno and is black and white pictures of man's inhumanity from 1990 to 2000. It includes such highlights as Kosovo, Rwanda, mm -hmm. Zaire, Chechnya. You get the idea? Mm -hmm. They're not happy birthday pictures. What I recognize is before I start the day by looking at one chapter of that, that how I am in the world affects everything in that book. Now, you talked about it being too big a thing. The fact of the matter is this conversation you and I are having, regardless of whether there's any audience that ever listens to it, is going to affect you and I. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but I have people I work with in China and India and Great Britain and all over the place. The way you and I are in this moment determines how, in, in some small measure, how I'm going to be with every other person I'm going to meet today. And when I recognize the import of that, then all of a sudden I get what the possibility is. 
when we're working on this work called Be a World That Works for Everyone, how long do you think it would take if you and I now get one other person and for uh, sequentially, we talk to three other people, each person, three other people. How long do you think it would take to uh, let 7 billion, 600 million people know that we need to create a world that works for everyone or we won't have one? How long would it take to get that message out? Well, I would imagine a few years. 20 days. Hmm. If you do the, do the arithmetic progression, it would take 20 days. We look at the world because we haven't made great use of all the technology we've got right now. Uh, we've got connections with Facebook, but as opposed to being used for good, a lot of it's being used for negative and mm -hmm. bullying and negativity. Uh, we need to recognize that we, the 7 billion of us, are all in this together. We don't act like that. We make decisions that if it's okay for me or it's okay for my company or whatever, uh, we can't continue to do those things. We have to start focusing on the fact that we have a very large, well, a, a large family but a relatively small one. If you look at that blue dot video, you get that we're just a dust flake in the universe. And where is the universe? The universe is expanding at the rate of 2 million miles a second. Into what? That miracle is what, why we're here, but we don't understand it. There is one thing we can do, though, and that's if I decide that I want to be useful, do the best I can do to be useful today, then I can make that choice this morning, and then it doesn't matter what you do. All I get to manage is how I'm going to be. So I feel silly saying that I'm, I, I've got a better grasp, because better might mean 5% better grasp of the, the some of the things you've shared about building intrinsic worth. I've got to ask... I know we don't have tons of time left, but one of the comments you made on the TED talk is about the capacity with us, you said, is, quote, unbelievable. And so, my, again, my next thought was, hmm, how do we access that better? Because, in other words, self-care is one thing, but stretching ourselves to be, to fulfill our potential is something altogether different. So, again, I guess one or two good starting points for people to stretch Again, um, I know you're looking for uh, a, a simple and quick answer. The um, the answer is internal discipline, and why and why it's so important often to have a person. For example, if somebody's struggling, find somebody that you uh, admire and you think might be willing to talk with you, and talk with them about how it is they do what they do. If you talk to people who produce results in life and they're really truthful and constructive people, they will tell you it's because they got an idea and they kept doing it and kept the positive and, and they had to handle all the things that go along. One of the things, Matt, is that when I, I had to overcome the fact that on the day my daughter was raped, I wanted to kill. Mm -hmm. And so all my notions of the fact that I'm a better person just went right down the toilet because I know I'm no different than anybody else. Anybody who's ever committed any crime, I've got all that in me. Once you know that, then you recognize that it is a precious opportunity to do something other than that. right? And it simply is a matter of becoming disciplined and finding people who point to things that are useful to you. You can't get this in a quick thing. Mm -hmm. It is uh, – it, it, develop a discipline of some kind. Um, and I and my temptation is also to say there have been plenty of things like Buddhism. The Buddha right at the moment said, please don't turn this into a philosophy. Practice, but don't turn it into a philosophy. There are 1,500 Buddhist sects now even in some cases armed fighting between Buddhists. The Buddha, the Buddha if he were here today, would dissolve all Buddhists. Hmm. He would say, stop doing that. You missed the whole point. They're arguing about whether they're more like him than anybody else. You get the idea. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is that I, you have to be disciplined in relationship to what you choose, but you cannot say that another person's way is not okay. Unless there's peace among the religions on this planet, we're never going to be at peace. Mm -hmm. Half of the wars are caused by uh, religious disagreements. Uh, the, the disciplines are all fine until I start saying my discipline is the same one you ought to use and we're not having yours in my school. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. <laughs> now, now we got trouble. A few, few final reasonably brief questions um first one is uh well none of these are easy questions the first one is i guess since your daughter was raped in 1979 who would you say you've become as a person wow who have i become um i've become more present um more loving um more patient um more humble 
um, in awe of her capacity to deal with what she had to do. Um, yeah, I, I think that probably covers it. Okay. Another, another, well, another of those questions that probably has many answers, I suppose. But so I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Gay Hendricks' book, The Big Leap. But I've, I haven't read The Big Leap, but I've known Gay for a long time. Okay. So, yeah, I read it multiple times last year. And I mean, the basic premise of the book, as far as I can tell, is that um, the main reason most people don't pursue their deepest passion is fear that if they do it and fail, that they won't be able to live with themselves on their way to their grave. What do you say to that? I say that there's another reason that's equally as significant. That is, they're afraid of success because then they'd have to give up all their stories about the world didn't work for them and they don't have the capacity. Most of why people don't produce results is not the fear of failure. They're quite familiar with failure. What they're afraid of is fear of success. If I all of a sudden start becoming successful, and success has nothing to do with money. Mm -hmm. It has to do with equanimity and peace of mind and all of those kinds of things. But yeah, um, unfortunately, almost any ca ca any catchphrase, and I don't, I'm not trying to uh, label uh, Gay Hendricks' notion as uh, as a catchphrase, but anything we use as a gimmick to trans to cause us to change our behavior is only a starting point. Um, one of the things I talk about is that if you actually understand the issues of internal motivation, you would never say, I'm a motivational speaker. Mm -hmm. You'd never do that. You'd say, I'm going to talk with you about things that will give you an opportunity to choose to be motivated. And if you begin to realize you can be motivated in small ways, you can begin to extrapolate that out. If it works here, it works there and keep doing it. But when you say the biggest dreams, the majority of people have something they would love to do and they just didn't go for it. And I suggest more often than not, it's not about failure, but it is about the fear of what would happen if they actually succeeded because they don't know what they do with it. We do have a negatively oriented society right at the moment. Um, the, the behavior of people in this country uh, in the last two years is, in my opinion, has been horrendous. And it shows up on the highways. The driving is getting mm -hmm. worse mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, we need to wake up, folks. We're either going to have a world that works for everyone or we're not going to have one. That's all there is to it. Yeah, and that's another topic for another day, I think, in some ways. Um, I know we need to wrap up here. How, how can people learn more about your work? Uh, go to www.theboothbyinstitute.org. Um, that will tell you uh, programs and stuff like that and articles about schools and various other things. Um, and also go to www.beaworldthatworksforeveryone.com. That's our website about developing uh, two things. Number one, the will to have a world that works for everyone and the communication systems that will be necessary. So, for example, all the things that are going brilliantly in Where to Invade Next, the 12 programs that Michael Moore pointed to, they're not an accident. They all have the same foundation. They're replicable. We need to learn how to do that and communicate to lots of people so they stop having to recreate the same solutions over and over again. Okay. Well, thank you, Bill. That's fantastic. And also, for those listening, all that information will be on the show notes page, which is uh, at matt-anderson.com, matt-anderson.com. So be sure to visit that and then click on those links, and uh, that way you can pursue more and learn more about um, about Bill's work. So, Bill, thank you so much. This has been uh, absolutely amazing. And uh, frankly, I wish we could talk for, for numerous hours more, but uh, a, a massive amount of useful things to think about on, on I think, perhaps the most jugular things that matter, you know, are going to get people moving the most, as you say, beyond just sort of quick strategies and tips. It goes a lot deeper than that. So, um, so thank you so much for that. And, uh, and with that, we'll, we'll wrap things up. Listeners, thank you so much for, for, uh, for, you know, being with us today and, um, do subscribe to the podcast if you haven't. And otherwise my biggest advice would be to watch Bill's Ted talk and then also to sort of learn more about what the work he's doing and the difference he's making in the world. And with that, I'll wrap up with my fa favorite question, which sort of is interesting because you sort of mentioned this earlier and, and worded it differently. But what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? This was Matt Anderson and the road not taken. <laughs>